Alright, time to compare some more of Shield Heroes anime to its light novel and manga counterparts. Yes, I know this one's a bit shorter than usual, but if I covered episode 15 too, then I feel that I'd miss a lot of the crucial elements regarding Raftalia's backstory. So, in exchange for today's shorter episode, the next one will be a special one. One that really digs deep into Raftalia's past as told by an entire dedicated side story. But that's for next time. Let's focus on what was skipped this time. Episode 14, Everlasting Memory covering chapters 20 to 22 from the manga, and chapters 1 to 2 from volume 4 of the light novel. And now Fumi and the rest of them had just barely escaped capture with the assistance of one of Melty's shadows. Once Mine had regained composure after their battle, she gathers everyone that she can to scour the forest in order to hunt them. Motoyasu of course follows suit, but Ren and Itsuki decide against this, and choose not to chase after Naofumi. They seem to be reconsidering their current stance on his wanted position. Now, deep in the forest, we find Naofumi sneaking his way through it, and while doing so, we're given his current perspective on the three other members of his group. According to the light novel, and likely for other unspecified reasons, to him, Raftalia now looks to have the appearance of an 18-year-old woman, one that's healthy and beautiful, but also rather serious. Philo looked more like a young girl who was around 10 years old. Her filolial form looked like some kind of giant owl or penguin-like creature, but he actually wasn't quite sure what it was. Melty also looked the same age and height as Philo. At first, she was rather calm and very polite, but he found that the more time he spent with her, the less patient and more stern she became. She was level 19, ranking at the lowest as both Philo and Raftalia were 40, and now Fumi was 39. Anyway, realizing that they were being hunted, Raftalia suggests that they hide under the cover of some of her illusion magic. Now Fumi accepts the idea, so Raftalia casts the spell called All First Hiding. Remember, the All converts it from single target to multi target, and the First means that it's in the lowest tier of spells. After the spell was complete, a tree formed by magic appeared from the ground, and it began to drop leaves over all of them until they were completely covered. This allowed for Motiyasu and his group to completely pass them by without noticing that they were there. Surprisingly though, Motoyasu did consider the fact that they could have been hiding due to Raftalia's magic, something that you'd think a doorknob like him wouldn't even consider, but he did. And if it wasn't for some fake footsteps that Naofumi had Philo make, it was likely that Motoyasu would have used one of his spear abilities to search for any magically hidden targets. Luckily though, he was led astray. But they didn't get too far from Naofumi's location when Mind finally just got fed up of looking. She proceeds to take out a bottle, empty its contents on the surrounding shrubbery, then casted first fire on it, bringing us now to the opening scene from the anime. This was a bit excessive, but Naofumi wasn't even surprised by this. He definitely didn't put it past mind to burn down an entire forest just to smoke them out. I mean, pretty much everything she did was a criminal act, so this one was no different. Of course, she didn't light the fire in front of Motoyasu though. She instead waited a bit behind, just out of visible distance from him. That way, she could get away with pinning the blame on Naofumi. Melty had attempted to extinguish the fire by subtly casting the water spell First Squall. Unfortunately though, the area that these rain clouds covered wasn't big enough to extinguish the flames. That was pretty much all they could do. Naofumi had no choice but to have everyone hop on Philo then run in the opposite direction of Motiyasu and Mai. Their overall goal though was to head southwest and meet the queen, as per the Shadow's request. However, after some travel, they found that many of the paths leading that direction were cut off or heavily damaged thanks to Motiyasu and mine. He wondered how they were able to know where they were heading when it should only be common knowledge to his group in the shadow. This made him consider the presence of enemy shadows. After all, if the queen's shadow could track his every move, then surely the king or mines could as well. So he had Raftalia and Philo constantly survey their surroundings for spies, especially since Raftalia seemed to have a knack for detecting when she was being watched likely coming from a trait related to her Tanuki half. With this constant fear of being watched and the lack of a solid plan, Naofumi wasn't sure what to do, which is when Melty suggests that they seek the help from a nearby noble that had close ties with the queen. Because this person was a mutual to Melty's mother, it's likely that they shared the same views, so it'd be a safe bet to assume that they'd be willing to provide assistance. As briefly stated in the anime, this noble was part of a faction that strived to maintain equality between all types of people throughout Malremark, and the leader of that faction was the lord over the land that Raftalia's old village was in, which was why Raftalia was able to live in peace before the wave. Unfortunately though, when the first wave did hit, the old lord had gotten killed in the invasion. 
He could have easily fled to safety to avoid danger, but he didn't. He couldn't abandon his people. That just wasn't who he was. Instead, he fought to protect as many of his people as he could, and he died as a hero. But with his death, that area also lost the only prominent voice that spoke on the Demihuman's behalf, putting in power a new lord who had a much lesser view of the Demihumans. In the novels, remembering this visibly irritated Raftalia, she was on the verge of anger, and it was clear that her current thoughts were only focused on revenge, something that wasn't really even hinted at in the anime. Regardless though, even if they did seek help from this noble, it was too risky to just waltz into the city, even with Raftalia's illusion magic or even covered by the darkness of night. Raftalia then has a pretty good idea. If every human is on the hunt for them, then perhaps they need to talk to some demi-humans. I mean, they were in an area where demi-humans were much more prominent, so perhaps some might have a different view on the shield hero and may even be willing to help. So, with nothing else coming to mind, they head to a nearby village and try to discreetly talk to some demi-humans. However, every time they would approach one, that person would immediately apologize then run away. They wouldn't report him to the soldiers or anything, they just didn't seem like they wanted to talk. As it would turn out, they had been ordered to never speak directly to the shield hero, but not by who you might think. You see, in an attempt to find out more information, Raftalia goes to talk to a demi-human by herself. She was actually able to start a conversation, and she's told that it was in fact the shield hero himself that gave the order to stay away, which was actually a massive problem. Now Fumi couldn't recall doing any such thing, so he wondered if it was perhaps the previous shield hero that gave this order. But it just didn't make sense, and the whole ambiguity of the situation only made now Fumi feel even more like the entire world was against him. After hearing this, Melty recalled that three days after Naofumi was summoned, her mother had told her that the shield hero did in fact order everyone to stay away from him. So perhaps it was Naofumi after all. Perhaps when, in a fit of rage after his accusation, anyone that tried to approach him was just immediately disregarded and told to stay away. And since demi-humans worshipped the shield hero, technically they were only fulfilling his wishes. Naofumi couldn't stand the thought of doing such a foolish thing, so he changes the subject back to how to get into the town. But that's when Reichnot shows up before them. In the novels, he actually doesn't have a name. He's simply referred to as Nice Guy. But to keep things simple, I'll just keep calling him Reichnot. In the anime, this would be Naofumi's first time meeting him. But in the manga and the light novel, Naofumi had actually done business with this man before. You see, back when he was traveling as a merchant, Naofumi had sold Reichnot an accessory. This past event made it easier for Naofumi to trust him. But he still wasn't just going to immediately accept that this man was an ally. Still though, they would be much better off and able to rest if they went with him, regardless of the risk. So they ended up accepting Reichnot's help. Now, when we get to the mansion, the whole dinner scene is pretty much as we saw. Even after, when in the bedrooms, the conversations were pretty spot on. Now Fumi's deeply rooted trust issues are highlighted through interactions with both Melty and Reichnot, and Raftalia is shown to be one of the few people that he does trust. It's not that he doesn't trust Melty, it's just that he's known Raftalia longer, so he's inclined to listen to her more than anyone. Anyway, Melty and Philo go for their walk while Naofumi tries to get some rest. A little bit later, he's awoken by the feeling that someone was approaching him. You see, ever since the situation with mine, he would always wake up whenever someone came close to him during a nap. And this time, it was Philo. Philo had wanted to sleep next to Naofumi, but Raftalia told her that Naofumi probably wouldn't want that. So instead, she takes over as lookout with Melty by her side so that Raftalia could also get some rest. That brings us to when the two of them have their talk as we see in the anime. But since they're in the room with Naofumi, while he's now just pretending to be asleep, he can actually hear everything that they're talking about. Hearing Melty speak her true feelings and Philo's surprisingly insightful responses to them made Naofumi view both in a slightly different light. Perhaps Philo was becoming more mature and perhaps he now had to be more considerate of Melty's upbringing. After all, she does have quite a bit of responsibility for a 10 year old girl. Now Fumi then manages to fall back asleep, and when he wakes up the second time, it brings us to this scene here. Except it's here that Melty suggests that she have Reichnot transport her back to the king. You see, after weighing all the options, she saw that as a safer and less impeding way of getting back to the capital. Mine wouldn't know where she was, and Naofumi wouldn't have to worry about protecting her all the time. It really did seem like a good idea, and it was through this that Naofumi realized that Melty was quite thoughtful when it mattered. However, once the morning came, 
they couldn't action on the plan anyway, since Reichnot had been reported for harboring the shield hero. Now, the maid that rushed in to help them was quite concerned for her master's safety, because should the shield hero be spotted, Reichnot would most definitely be executed for treason. So they had to escape as stealthily as possible, but because they weren't with Philo and Melty, they couldn't leave just yet. As the soldiers closed in on them, they had no choice but to hide in the kitchen. The soldiers then entered, and Raftalia was getting ready to engage. But Naofumi knew that if they attacked them here, then that would be the end for Reichnot, so they waited. As one of the soldiers was about to open the closet that they were hiding in, Melty bursts into the kitchen, just like in the anime. The fat noble then enters shortly after, and he escorts Melty away after being convinced that the shield hero was no longer there. After confirming the soldiers were all gone, Naofumi regroups with Philo, and now tries to figure out what to do. There were a million things to consider, especially now that he had the opportunity to safely make it to the queen or the border. But after weighing the options and considering Melty's act of self-sacrifice, he knew he just couldn't betray her by abandoning her. So he first goes and gets as much information as he can regarding Melty's location. He's given a layout of the mansion, and is told that Melty will likely be held in a back room on the second floor. However, simply taking Melty back wouldn't fix all the problems. They also had to make everyone think that Reknot stole Melty away from Naofumi, so that he wouldn't be branded as a traitor. Now, while they were trying to figure things out, Raftalia had a much more serious disposition. She was almost emotionless. Her mind seemed far away, as if it was focused on a single thing. And Naofumi quickly knew that something was wrong. Of course, we know that it was because of her past as a true slave. This wasn't displayed as prominently in the anime, since there were many more cues in the novels and the manga that she was clearly getting ready to get her revenge. After finally settling on a plan, they make their way to the mansion, and as soon as they hop over the fence, these monster dogs begin to bark. They were creatures known as guardians, raised with the purpose of alerting soldiers when they smelled something unfamiliar in the wind. They were also equipped with a device on their back that would emit a whistle-like noise should an intruder enter. They weren't very strong though, as Fila was able to quickly take them out. Meanwhile, Nafumi and Raftalia had rushed ahead, knocking out any soldiers that they came across. Now, remember how there were so many demi-humans at the front gate? Well, after they saw that Naofumi invaded the mansion, they also followed behind. This resulted in most of the soldiers becoming occupied with rioting demi-humans, allowing Naofumi to run right up to the front door. Then, with the help of some soldiers, they were able to quickly find where Melty was being held. Reknot was there as well. He was just on the floor after being tortured for some time. As we saw in the anime, Naofumi uses Airstrike Shield to split Melty from the noble. Then Philo quickly takes him out with a kick. This was now Raftalia's perfect chance to take him out for good. But for some reason, she doesn't. She insists that they need to take care of Melty and Reichnot's wounds first, which was surprising given how tense she'd been up to this point. This was slightly different in the manga, because after Melty was freed, Raftalia immediately jumps in and stabs the noble in the arm. She's getting ready to deliver the finishing blow, but the noble manages to bring out not one, but two whips and disarm Raftalia. He now had the upper hand, and was about to start whipping her, but Naofumi was able to step in before that, and he caught both whips, giving Raftalia the time to recover and stab him with her magic sword. But that was in the manga only. Let's go back to the novels, where she had actually waited before attacking the noble. Naofumi ran over to Reichnot to heal his wounds. While doing so, Naofumi whispers to him that he needs to deny having any association with them, or else he would probably be taken away again. Reichnot simply acknowledges that he likely wouldn't have lived past the night, since the fat noble would have killed him anyway for being a demi-human supporter. Reichnot wanting the demi-humans to be free just conflicted too deeply with the plans of the other noble, so he would have pounced at any excuse to take Reichnot out. Also, Reichnot wouldn't just disregard the very people who saved him. With the way that Melty and Naofumi had been treating him, Reichnot now knew that all accusations against them had to be false, so he chose their side. But now that he's chosen to stand with the shield, he couldn't just go back to his mansion and continue business as usual. He tells Naofumi that he'll go into hiding until everything settles. Hearing this, Naofumi was relieved that Reichnot would now be safe, but at the same time, he felt bad since he basically just ruined this man's life. Anyway, after ensuring that both Melty and Reichnot were fine, Raftalia finally focuses her attention on the noble. She slowly approaches him, all while Nafumi simply watched. He didn't intervene because this was fully her choice to make, and he would support her with whatever choice she made. It's likely he thought that regardless of whether it was right or whether it was ethical, he would stand by her side just as she did for him. 
And now Fumi felt no compassion for the sorry man in front of him. What he did to Aftalia was unforgivable, and he wasn't about to prevent her from taking her revenge should she want it. And that was everything skipped in episode 14. I know we're getting to the good part, but we can't quite go into episode 15 just yet. And I know the skipped content from episode 14 wasn't quite as epic as the fight from episode 13, but there was still some pretty decent character development, and we're about to get a whole lot more for Aftalia. So make sure you come back for the next video where we'll cover an entire side story that was dedicated to Raftalia's past. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So until next time, ciao!